As noted in the church bulletin, our scripture this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise and glory, the praise of his glory, we have freely given us the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Once again, we want to say good morning to all of you. And Arthur says good morning, too. I just love to see the little ones running up here and turning around and looking back and waving. And one of these days, Arthur will be there, and he probably will be the leader. <laughs> Um, Betty wasn't feeling well, and so they had to go ahead and go home. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we pray your blessings upon Betty and that she'll receive comfort and relief from her pain that she's going through at this time. She was such an inspiration to us to come and be with us today in spite of that pain. And Father, we're just so thankful that the faith of those that are suffering are such an inspiration to us. And we realize, Heavenly Father, that Job of old demonstrates that faith demonstrated in trial is a great testimony of that dedication, loyalty, and commitment. That as Job said, though he slay me, yet I will serve him. And the spirit and attitude of those who have suffered so much in this world and yet cling to you, Heavenly Father, will be a testimony far greater than any sermon that has ever been preached. And we pray, dear Lord, that as we enter into a sermon lesson, that our message will be timely and effective and helpful. And we know, Heavenly Father, that you have truly imparted within us a sense of your divine presence. And eternity has been put in our bosom. And we realize, Heavenly Father, that spark of something beyond ourselves is so powerful that it can blaze a great fire of zeal and enthusiasm for your cause and that we can spread this love throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage in Ephesians chapter 1 reminds me of something I heard many years ago which gave me an overview of 
the whole Bible. That God's eternal plan is demonstrated through the scriptures like a scarlet thread that runs through Genesis through Revelation. That it begins with the Old Testament that constantly from Genesis 3.15 of the seed that would destroy the head of the serpent, which is a prophecy of the death of Jesus Christ right at the fall. That that demonstrated the beginning of prophecy to reveal God's eternal plan And it began by simply saying, someone is coming. Someone is coming. You fast forward to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And God calls this man out of Ur of Chaldees, probably where Kuwait is today. And said, leave your family and go to a land I will show you. In Hebrews chapter 11, he went out not knowing where he was going. And he went. And he followed the lead of God. And God said, I will bless you and make a great nation from your seed. And in thy seed, I will bless the whole world. That obviously, according to Genesis chapter 3 is the seed of Jesus Christ. He did not speak of many seeds, Paul says, but of one seed, which was Christ. Someone is coming. Someone is coming. And we read in chapter 22 of the book of Psalms that someone was going to come and he was going to suffer greatly at the hands of wicked men And even his feet and his hands would be pierced. The the crucifixion of Jesus is graphically described in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Once again, we discover the, the silver thread is just being woven through the Old Testament that someone is coming. In Isaiah chapter 7, we discover years later, 700 B.C., that that God predicted that he would send Emmanuel, God in the flesh, through a virgin. And the right translation of that is that a virgin will be pregnant, not shall become pregnant. Hopefully most virgins, you know, most virgins ultimately do become pregnant, but they're not virgins when they are pregnant pregnant but the text is that a virgin will be expecting and when he comes his name will be called Emmanuel someone is coming and then in chapter 9 he says a child is given in this prophetic vision as if it already occurred he says and his name will be God, eternal Father, wonderful counselor, almighty God. Who could this be? Can you imagine a Jew 700 years before Christ reading these prophecies and scratching their head and saying, we believe in one God and yet we read of God coming into the likeness of our flesh. Who could this be? Who could this be? Someone is coming. And then the last book of the Bible it says that a messenger will occur preparing for the coming of the Lord. The last prophecy of the Old Testament says someone is going to come and prepare the way of the coming of the Lord himself. And so throughout the whole Bible, the Old Testament, is that, is that scarlet thread about someone. Someone is coming. And it ends with someone is going to come and prepare the way for him. And we open the New Testament 
And we see John the Baptist. And it declares that he was the prophesied messenger sent by God, predicted in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. That here he is, the messenger who is sent to prepare the path for the coming of the Lord. Preparing a people for Jesus Christ. And then we find Jesus coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. John looks up and he sees him coming. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus submits himself to be baptized. And John, what did he say? But I can't baptize you. You should baptize me. But Jesus said, Suffer it to be done that all righteousness be fulfilled. The sinless Son of God still obeyed a commandment of the Lord to be baptized, even though it was Mark chapter 1 for the forgiveness of sins. He had no sins to forgive, but he refused to neglect the commandment of the Lord. And what happened after he came up out of the water? But the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, and the voice came out of heaven once of the first of three occurrences of God speaking from heaven in the ministry of Jesus. And John heard the Father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son. And the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises that someone was coming. And now, in Matthew through John, we discover someone has come. Someone has come. The divine plan through eternity has come. Finally, people would say, is this the one that has been predicted? Is this the prophet? Is this the Messiah? Is this the son of David? David? Why are these questions recorded in the New Testament? Because every one of those questions the people had were answered. Jesus even said, if you do not believe me, the words believe the works that I perform, for they bear witness of me. And then, Jesus goes about teaching. And people said, never any man spoke like this man. The religious leaders sent a guard, soldiers, to pick up Jesus and arrest him and take him to court. And they came back empty-handed. They said, where's Jesus? We sent you to arrest him. And they said, never man spoke like this man. This powerful presence of Jesus. They knew that they were in the presence of greatness. They may not have understood, but they understood that one greater than all the rabbis was here. And Jesus said that someone is greater than Solomon is here. Now, not only did he have the teachings that surpassed all the scribes and the rabbis, but he performed all these works and wonders and signs, which Peter said he did in the midst of you, and none of you can deny this, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. None of you can deny all the works that he performed. In John chapter 20, John records that many other signs therefore did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe and that you might have life through his name. So yes, The Gospels declare that someone has come. Somebody might say, well, how do we know for sure that Jesus came? Well, not only the Gospels testify about it, 
the existence of the church testifies as to his existence, but also in the secular writings like Suetonius and Tacitus and others acknowledge that Jesus lived and died under the governorship of Pilate. So you see, someone has come. Someone has come. In the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Jesus ascends back to heaven. Luke continues his writing to Theophilus. The Luke account is continued in his second letter, the book of Acts. And it begins with the ascension of Jesus back to heaven. And an angel told the disciples, this same Jesus that was taken up to you will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And in Revelation chapter 1, we discover that John says, when he comes back, every eye will see him. Now that means if every eye will see his return, that means those that are dead and those that are alive will see him which requires the resurrection of the dead as taught by Jesus and the apostles. So yes, Jesus has come. But now we have Acts through Revelation. What do we have here? As we noted in Acts chapter 1, the promise is for Jesus to come back again. Jesus, someone is coming. Jesus Someone has come, Jesus, and someone is coming again. The divine plan through the ages, from the foundation of the world, the eternal plan that is mentioned in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, is that Jesus would come and give his life as a sacrifice for sin, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John Chapter 3 and verse 16. And that ultimately those that are prepared for his second coming will be taken up with him and so forever be with Jesus Christ. Now, in almost every epistle from Romans through Revelation, the second coming of Christ is either stated explicitly or hinted at. And so, in a sense, the Christian faith is apocalyptic. That means that it looks forward towards the second coming, the end of the world. Now, there are different theories about what's going to happen in the end, but all theories aside, it's going to happen just as God wants it to happen. And we shouldn't spend so much time thinking about what's going to happen as we are where we're going to be when it happens. With the Lord or not with the Lord. Now the message is that we be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And so because of the sense of urgency uh, with regard to the coming of Christ... Because he said that he's going to come like a thief in the night. Well, as you know, I don't think that a thief will send a letter uh, to your address saying that on a certain night, a certain time, I'm going to come and I'm going to rob you. He will not give any warning in advance. And so when Jesus said he's going to come as a thief in the night, I believe it. And all these people that are setting dates for the second coming of Christ are wasting your time and their own. And there are more important things than setting dates for the second coming of Christ. And we heard that demonstrated and communicated effectively by our brother Rob a while ago. That we need to have that heart right with God. And so this is what the letters are for. So through Romans, through uh, Jude, and including the letters in the book of Revelation, and the whole letter, is to help us to keep our, right, our heart right with God. So in a sense, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are written to develop faith. 
The book of Acts, which records the growth of the church, the preaching of the gospel, and examples of, of conversion, tells us how to take our faith generated by the life of Jesus in the fourfold gospel, and then in the book of Acts, discover how we become a Christian and what the church is all about, evangelistic, missionary-minded. And then, having become saved, the epistles are written and addressed to us to how we can remain faithful. I mentioned this, I think, in the Bible class, that if you would take every controversy, every reference to false teaching, every reference to immoral acts, they're condemned out of the epistles, you wouldn't have much left. They were written to be addressed to churches and their problems, their contemporary problems. <clears throat> and people don't change. If you read history, if you read the time of the apostles, the secular writing, we call that Western Civ, that basically people are the same as they were back then. We just have more ways of doing evil things. <clears throat> but they're the same old problem, the same old sins. And so the relevancy of the epistles that addressed current problems in the church then is relevant to us today. And that's why it's so important to study the Word of God. It's important to join in the Bible studies that are offered by the church to try to get a deeper understanding of the word. And it's so amazing how helpful and beneficial it is to study with a group of people. I'm going to share with you one of the statements made by the Apostle Paul.